Welcome everyone to this program uh, for members, alumni, and volunteers for Chi Phi Fraternity. Uh, due to the generous support of the Chi Phi Educational Trust, we are able to bring you this program today as part of our Building Better Men webinar series for the spring. In this program, we'll get to hear from Dr. Gentry McCreary and his program, Redefining Brotherhood. My name is Ryan Lugabel, and I serve Chi Phi as the Director of Education and Accountability. Before we begin, I want to go over just a few logistical pieces for today's program. Please note that when you registered, you should have received two different audio options for the program. So you could either log in through your computer speakers or by dialing in to listen to the, today's webinar. If you experience any audio issues, please try launching the other option. You can submit questions through the Q&A feature in Zoom. And some questions you may have um, will be addressed throughout the program, but we'll have some time reserved at the end specifically for question and answer. Dr. Gentry McCray is the CEO and managing partner of Dyad Strategies, LLC, a consulting firm working with college campuses and fraternal organizations on issues related to research, assessment, and strategic planning. Over the last six years, Dyad Strategies has been engaged in a long longitudinal research project aiming to better understand the culture of fraternity and sorority chapters and trends within the fraternal community. The surveys that they have developed in that research have been completed by over 100,000 fraternity and sorority members across North America. His session today will dive deeply into that data, sharing insights with chapter leaders on how the fraternity and sorority experience can be enhanced and improved. Prior to his work at Dyad Strategies, Dr. McCreary worked for over 12 years in higher education, including nearly five years as director of Greek life at the University of Alabama. His award-winning research examines the psychology of hazing, the moral development of college students, and the roots of fraternal brotherhood and sisterhood. He is a widely sought after expert on Greek life and hazing prevention, and has appeared on the Today Show, NBC Nightly News, and CNN Headline News. Please welcome Gentry McCurry. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Ryan, and <clears throat> good night, good evening, everyone. It's, it's my pleasure to join you. I'm excited to be here to talk a little bit about the work that we do at Dyad Strategies, and a little bit about what we're learning about the fraternity experience, and in particular, about the nature of brotherhood, which is what we're gonna talk about tonight. So let me share my screen and we will get started. So brotherhood is this word that gets thrown around a lot in fraternity world. Uh, you can't hang around a fraternity house very long during recruitment without hearing someone say, oh, we've got the best brotherhood on campus. And I love it when guys say that because uh, my response is always, oh, do you? Talk to me about why your brotherhood is so good. Brotherhood is this word that we throw around a lot, but prior to uh, us really beginning this research, no one had ever really bothered to define exactly what that word meant. And, and what we learned is that if you ask any five members of your chapter for their definition of brotherhood, you would get five different answers. And, and that's really what motivated this research to begin with. I was doing my doctoral dissertation and I was writing about the psychology of hazing. And as I was doing some focus groups and some interviews, uh, guys kept using the word brotherhood. And I noticed one day, it just struck me that people didn't always mean the same thing when they used that word. That word means different things to different people. Uh, and, and I was fascinated by this. And I said, well, I wonder if we can figure out the different ways that guys think about brotherhood. I wonder then if we can measure the different ways that guys think about brotherhood. And if we're able to do both of those things, then we can understand, does the way you think about brotherhood matter? Uh, and in the last six years that we've been engaged in this research, we found that, yes, we can figure out what those schema of brotherhood are. We can measure them. And we've learned a lot about why it matters. But what I'd like to start by doing is, is to have you answer this question. And so go ahead and use the, the chat feature um, in, the, in, in Zoom, the, the chat box. And I want you to just very simply write down your definition of brotherhood. Uh, and maybe you've never been asked to do this before. Uh, 
but I want you to share what your definition is. I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a second so I can pull up the chat box. And if you'll just type in your, your definition of brotherhood, I would love to, to see what folks say. We'll open up the chat box here and, and see what folks share. Being there for someone, even if you don't personally like them or hang out, this idea that we're there for each other, yeah, that, that we're through thick and thin, uh, commitment and trust, that we're, both of those words come up a lot. We'll spend some time tonight diving into the research, how brotherhood is connected to, to commitment and trust. Shared values, I love that concept of shared values and this idea of building each other up and supporting each other. Absolutely, Matthew, good, good stuff. Other, other thoughts on, on brotherhood? See if we got any more coming through. The the reason I like to ask this question as we start is because what what you see is that while the answers in the chat box are similar to one another, they're also different. They're not exactly the same. We we think about this word, we define this word in different ways, and part of me has always thought that that's kind of neat, right? That well, you know, it's this loosely defined concept, and we all think about it in our own way. But when you think about brotherhood, it really is the foundation of the fraternity experience. And if we don't really understand or know what that is, that's a little bit problematic. So that that really is what motivated this research. Uh, Nick shared a strong personal relationship between men created through some group, right? Family, occupation, organization. Nick, I think that's actually a really cool way to think about it, that the dynamics of the relationship of what we call brotherhood um, exist outside of fraternities, right? We have, we have a unique word for it, but you might have the same concepts at play with a sports team, uh, within a family, within a company you work for, a church or synagogue you grew up attending. There's a lot of different ways to think about these, these group dynamics. So appreciate everyone sharing there. I'm going go to go back to the screen here. So what is brotherhood? A lot of different things to a lot of different people. And if you walked into your chapter house tonight, and asked everyone to write down your, their definition of brotherhood, you would get a lot of different answers. And the analogy that I like to use when I think about brotherhood is this idea of the currency of fraternity. And, and here's what I mean by this. Like money, brotherhood is exchanged and it has value, right? So one day you might be on the giving end of brotherhood. Someone exhibits brotherhood towards you. You have an issue and someone helps you with it. You have a problem and people are there to support you and have your back. So you're on the receiving end. In other days, you're there supporting, being there, uh, having the back of, of someone else. And so it goes back and forth. There's value. We keep track of, of those things. And, and if you take that analogy to its logical end, what I have always argued is that if you think of a fraternity as a business, brotherhood is our product. Fraternities are in the brotherhood business. And, and frankly, I think the reason that fraternity has continued to be so successful in spite of all of our well-documented challenges is that we're actually pretty good at delivering on our core business. We deliver brotherhood in a really profound and meaningful way in a lot of cases. And so uh, if, if you think of it in that way, if, if brotherhood is the product that we offer, then it makes sense that we understand that product a little bit more. And that's really the purpose of our conversation tonight is to really help you understand the brotherhood and the unique aspects and the unique dynamics of a brotherhood in your chapter. As I shared a second ago, if you walked into your chapter tonight and asked everyone to write down their definition of brotherhood, you would get a lot of different answers. If there's 80 men there, you're going to get 80 different answers. But what we've learned now in the seven or so years that we've been doing this research is that I could take those 80 different answers and I could neatly lump them into one of four categories. There's four unique definitions of brotherhood or, or in our research, what we call schema. Uh, if you've studied psychology, you know that a schema is a mental framework. It's a way that you think about something. So there's a, a schema of brotherhood. There's a way that you think about a framework that you have in terms of how you conceptualize brotherhood. And, and we're able to uniquely measure four. 
The first one is called Brotherhood Based on Solidarity. This encompasses probably 70% of the answers uh, is often the most salient when you ask fraternity members about brotherhood, you very often get a solidarity answer. And solidarity is this idea that we're there for each other, we support each other, we have one another's back. If my brother needs me, I'm gonna be there for him and vice versa. Solidarity is often very explicitly reinforced. Uh, many fraternities, their ritual specifically talks about being there for a brother when he's in need, having a brother's back when he has challenges. That's a vestige of our longstanding and historical connection to Freemasonry. Uh, a lot of fraternal ritual is derived from Masonic ritual. And this idea of solidarity, of being there for one another, of helping your brothers in, in their time of need is very Masonic in nature. Uh, and so a lot of fraternity ritual speaks directly to this aspect of brotherhood. I've never seen Kai Fi's ritual, but I bet yours talks about that in, in some shape or form. The second aspect of brotherhood is brotherhood based on shared social experiences. This is the sense of camaraderie that comes about as a result of all the fun things that we do together. So time around the house, the relationships, doing things with people, all the experiences and all the relationships that come about as a result of all of those experiences we have together, that's brotherhood, right? So this is the fun side of brotherhood, the sense of camaraderie uh, that comes about as a result of the, those fun times we spend together. The third and maybe the most important aspect of brotherhood, uh, and one that explains probably another 20% of the answers that we receive when we ask questions about brotherhood, is related to this notion of brotherhood based on belonging. Uh, this is that notion of being part of something uh, that's more than just a group of friends, more than just a group of people who have your back. This is where it starts to feel like family. I feel like I belong. I feel like I matter. I feel like people care about me. This is strongly connected to trust, commitment, all those deeper emotional connections that come about as a result of really feeling accepted, included, valued as part of the brotherhood. Belonging, really, really important as an aspect of brotherhood. And then another 10% of the answers that we get with regards to this question has to do with accountability. Uh, someone mentioned shared values in their, in their response, and, and that's strongly connected to this idea of accountability, that as a brotherhood, we have shared values, and part of our obligations to one another as brothers is to hold one another accountable to those shared values. So if you see a brother acting in a way, acting in a manner that's inconsistent with those values, those standards of Chi-Fi, you call them out, you address it, you hold them accountable, and we have systems and structures by which we do that. And, and we'll talk about some of those systems and structures. So we can actually measure, we're obviously not going to do that tonight, but when we do projects through national organizations or through campuses, we measure where chapters fall along the trajectory of each of these four aspects of brotherhood. So we can give each chapter a brotherhood profile. So we can look at your, your combination of scores of these four aspects of brotherhood and see are there areas where you're strong? Are there areas where you're deficient? Uh, and, and what we found as we've done this research is that these four things, these four aspects of brotherhood are strongly connected to almost every other outcome that you could imagine related to the fraternity experience. These four things are connected to your commitment to your chapter, retention, your levels of engagement and satisfaction. Uh, they're connected with your attitudes about hazing, they're connected with how much alcohol you drink. Uh, a lot of relationships between these four aspects of brotherhood and, and almost everything else you could think about as it relates to the fraternity experience. So what I wanna do for the next few minutes is to dive a little deeper into each of these and help you understand a little bit of that research and what we've learned as we've done this work uh, over the last several years about how each aspect of brotherhood really matters in predicting other aspects of the fraternity experience. So we'll start with solidarity. And as I introduce each of these concepts or, or reintroduce them, what I'm actually gonna share on the screen is from our early qualitative research, someone who gave a definition that really neatly explains and defines this aspect of brotherhood. So we had someone say, I am my brother's keeper. That means if we're out and he gets into trouble, it's my job to have his back no matter what. And several of you in the chat box, when I asked you a minute ago to define brotherhood, you, you referenced solidarity, this idea of being there for one another, 
uh, supporting one another. If your brother needs you, you're there for him and vice versa. And in some ways, this is a very beautiful, maybe the most beautiful demonstration of brotherhood. I've heard so many wonderful stories over the years of fraternity members who, who had a brother in need and rallied around him and supported him. I, I'm always reminded of a, a story that, that I heard about uh, a young man whose mother passed away very unexpectedly. Uh, and so he was you know, away from campus for a few days, back home dealing with family stuff. And he lived a few hours away from campus uh, and he's like, you know, we're at the church, the funeral's about to begin, and, and I hear, you know, a bunch of shuffling, a bunch of people coming into the church, and I turn around, and it's my entire fraternity. They had carpooled and driven several hours to be at the funeral of this woman who they'd never met, but hey, our brother needs us to, to show him that we have his back, and what a, what a powerful demonstration of, of brotherhood, and there's so many other great examples that I'm sure many of you could share. Of, of times when your brothers were really there for you to, to help you when you needed it. But the analogy I like to use when I talk about this aspect of brotherhood, this solidarity aspect of brotherhood is, uh, is, is Star Wars. I'm, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I'm sure some of you are as well. If you're a Star Wars fan, you know that the force has two sides, right? It has a light side and it has a dark side. And I think of solidarity in much the same way for all of those good, positive really beautiful examples of, of brotherhood when we think about solidarity, there is also some problematic aspects of solidarity. There's this darker underbelly that if this idea of solidarity gets taken too far, it can manifest itself in really problematic ways. And, and to demonstrate that, I'm actually going to go back to this young man's definition. When you read what he says about brotherhood, I want you to reread his statement. I want you to think about what stands out as potentially problematic, that if you carried it to its logical extreme, could manifest itself in some problematic and unhealthy ways. And it's it, people very quickly pick up on it. It's, it's this last clause here, this idea, I got to have his back no matter what, that I support him no matter what, even if he's doing something wrong, even if he's doing something bad, even if he's doing something problematic. And that's how we see that dark side of solidarity emerge, that it becomes less about brotherhood and less about positive altruistic support. And in, in some cases, it turns into almost a gang mentality. This idea that, oh, you know, if, if we're out at the bar and my brother you know, gets into a fight, like we're all going to jump in and have his back. That's brotherhood. That's not brotherhood, right? Like that's, that's something else. That's something different. It, and it's not too far-fetched to think about a lot of real world examples of how this dark side of solidarity could play out. You know, imagine a brother is accused by someone of sexual assault. Do you just support him and have his back no matter what? Or do you say, hey, this is, this is a pretty serious allegation. We, we have standards. This is inconsistent with, with who we are and what we're about. And so we need to deal with this and address this. Chapters respond to that scenario in different ways based on kind of the level of solidarity. Is it healthy or is it unhealthy? And so when we measure this, it can be both too high and it can be too low. If it's too low in a chapter, you don't get enough of the light side of solidarity, but if it's too high, you start to see some of the dark side emerge. And the reason we know that, again, thinking about our research and, and the connections between solidarity and the other things that we studied, Solidarity is a strong predictor of attitudes about hazing, in particular, the severity of hazing that you would say is okay, uh, that, that you would tolerate in your chapter, a thing we measure called hazing tolerance. As solidarity goes up, hazing tolerance goes up. The more you care about this idea of brotherhood based on solidarity, the more severe forms of hazing you say you would be okay with within your chapter. And I'd love you to maybe think about why that is, why solidarity and hazing are so strongly connected. Uh, my theory, based on the research that we've done, is that a lot of chapters use hazing as a means by which to achieve solidarity. The idea being that if we put these new members through a really difficult experience, they will come together as a group. They'll learn to support one another, have one another's back. Uh, but the question is always at what cost and, and what are we really trying to accomplish? And so we know that that solidarity in chapters where solidarity gets too high, we often also see 
some challenging data around hazing tolerance and, and attitudes that are more accepting of hazing. The second aspect of brotherhood is what we call brotherhood based on shared social experiences. And, and that's this idea that again, it's the sense of camaraderie that comes about as a result of all the fun things that we do together. This guy said, I know it sounds cliche, but it's the times you'll never remember with the people you'll never forget. And I think I saw that on a t-shirt at some point, but this was how this guy thought about brotherhood, right? When you ask him, well, what is brotherhood? How do you define it? This is what he said, right? It's the fun times. It's, it's all those great memories, the road trips, the tailgating before football games, the formals, the socials, all that stuff, just hanging around the house with my boys, right? Like all those memories that I have, all that sense of camaraderie that comes about as a result of all the fun that we have together, that's what brotherhood is. And like solidarity, this aspect of brotherhood has a dual nature to it in terms of it can be both too high and it can be too low. There's a sweet spot. There's an ideal range. If this gets too low in a chapter, guys are basically saying, well, it's not fun. I, I don't have friends. I don't have that sense of camaraderie. I, I'm, I'm not building those relationships. That's not going to be a very successful chapter. But what we've learned as we've done this research is that if this aspect of brotherhood gets too high, it becomes a driver of other problematic behaviors. In particular, two, the first one, maybe not surprisingly, being alcohol use. The more you care about the social aspect of brotherhood, the more you drink. Doesn't come as a surprise, right? Often the fun involves alcohol. And so people who prioritize and chapters who prioritize the fun side of brotherhood tend to drink more, right? So a, a relationship there that's not surprising. The other thing that this aspect of brotherhood predicts is a thing that I, one of my favorite things that we measure, it's a, it's a construct called social status importance. And, and what we measure there, every campus that I've ever worked with has what I would call this kind of social pecking order or social hierarchy. So there's this perception that there are these top tier socially elite fraternities, and then there's you know middle tier, okay, not the best, but certainly not awful fraternities. And then you've got the groups down here. It would be mean to call them bottom tier. We'll say they're upwardly mobile or, or aspirational, but they're groups that don't have much social clout, much social status on campus. And what we measure in our research is not where you are in that social pecking order, but rather how much you care about where you are, how much your members care about your chapter's place in the social pecking order. And, and what we found is that the more you care about the social side of brotherhood, the more likely you are to care about your chapter's place in the social pecking order, which is problematic, right? It's it, If all you think about is your chapter's place in the social hierarchy, and that's the lens through which you view decisions, again, easy to think about some ways that we might go off the rails. And, and so what I want you to do, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing here in a second, we'll go back to the chat box. What I would love for you to share is some of the issues and challenges that you've seen in your chapter. Or, or, or even with members of your pledge class who only see brotherhood through that lens of a social experience? What are some of the issues that your chapter has had with those guys who only care about the social side of brotherhood? We'll stop sharing for a second and go back to the chat box. What are some of the problems you've seen in your chapter with those guys who only care about the social side of brotherhood? Let's talk about that for a minute. disregarding COVID guidelines. It's a brave new world. Yeah. They don't care about your stupid COVID rules. Like I joined a fraternity because I want to party. We're going to have parties. We're going to invite people over and, you know, the rules be damned. And, and yeah, I would imagine that's been a real challenge for a lot of you over the last year that these guys just don't care about the guidelines. They're going to do what they want to do. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Matthew. Other thoughts on that issues, challenges, your chapters have had with these guys who only care about the social experience. It's the first time I've gotten that response. You know, we're, we're in the post-COVID world now, and it's like, yeah, of course. Of course those guys don't care about COVID guidelines. Only want to come around when girls are over. Literally, yeah. Uh, leave because there's... <laughs> well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. 
uh, dude shows up at a party and he sees that it's only guys there and he leaves. Not enough girls here. I'm going to go to the bar. What a great brother, right? What a great brotherhood. Um, I don't care about hanging out with these guys. I joined a fraternity because I want to hook up with girls. And so that's, that's kind of how I view the, the experience. Yeah. The, these guys, that, that's all they care about. They don't really care about the more meaningful stuff. They're there to, to drink, party, hook up, have a good time. Thanks for sharing that. Will. other, other issues or challenges your chapters have seen. Yeah, you know, these guys tend to be your grade risks. You know, these these tend to not be the ones who bring your GPA up. These guys tend to be the frequent flyers from your standards board. Uh, discourage financial decisions. Yeah, social budget is well funded, right? We're not doing any philanthropy, but got to make sure the social budget is right. The the word that often comes up when we think about these guys is the word selfish, right? What's in it for me? As long as I'm having fun yay fraternity, but the minute it stops being fun for me, then I'm going to just peace out, right? So retention, motivation, getting them to show up for chapter, getting them to show up for service projects, philanthropy events. Like if it's not a party, it, they're not interested. So very selfish in terms of, of how they kind of view and think about the brotherhood. Th thank you guys for, for sharing those examples. Those are those are really helpful as we think about the challenge with, again, the balance of brotherhood. And again, if you don't have enough of the fun side of brotherhood, that's also problematic. Like if anything, being in a fraternity should be fun. So if this is too low, that's a problem as well. But if you have too many of those guys who only care about the social part of brotherhood, it, it's not too hard to imagine how that can really throw a fraternity off track. Third as to Third aspect of brotherhood is belonging. So again, this idea that it's about the deep, meaningful connection, this idea that it's a family, really close knit. I love this guy's definition. He said, from day one, this was a place where I just felt at home. I feel sorry for guys in fraternities who feel like they have to pretend to be something that they're not. I've never felt that way. I feel like I can be myself because I know that my brothers value the same things that I value. This is a guy who really feels connected. This is a guy who's really bought into these. This is just a place where I feel at home. This is just a place where I feel like I matter. I feel like I have a lot in common with these people. I feel connected in, in deep and meaningful ways. This is not just surface level. We party together on the weekend. This is a place where I truly feel valued. This is a place where I truly feel connected. And this aspect of brotherhood is so vitally important to the fraternity experience. I should have put a couple of guys here in Kai-Fi letters, um, but, but I, I want you to think about that guy in your chapter who's always wearing letters, right? Like never leaves the house, not wearing, not wearing Kai-Fi something. And what we often find, I always think about a guy in my chapter. I was an AGR at the University of Tennessee. I, I don't think that was in my intro. Um, so there was a guy in my chapter named Johnny Barnes and Johnny never left the house not wearing AGR something, right? He had all the shirts. He had a hat. He had a pullover for the wintertime. He had letters on his truck. He got an ankle tat. So he literally never left the house not wearing AGR something. And, and that's, a, that's a really powerful thing. You know, those guys are often our really best members. And what we found is that belonging is the biggest predictor of commitment. When we measure commitment, and there's a couple of different ways you can be committed to a fraternity. There's an emotional commitment. So these guys who say, you know, I love Kai-Fi, I love my brothers. So that love, that emotional connection, that's what's driving your commitment. Or there's a, a, a sense of obligation, right? This idea of I feel like Kai-Fi has given a lot to me. I've gotten a lot out of this experience. And so because of that, I feel this duty to give back, to stay involved, to stay active, to give back. And so both of those things, emotional commitment and that sense of obligation commitment are driven the most by sense of belonging. If you feel like you belong, if that's a strong aspect of your brotherhood, your member is going to be much more committed. It also drives a thing called org ID. And that's, that's this guy, right? organizational identification, the extent to which your identity as a person is wrapped up in your membership in the organization. So my friend Johnny, he didn't want to be known just as Johnny Barnes. He wanted to be known as 
Johnny Barnes, the AGR, his membership in the fraternity was a big piece of his identity on campus. He wanted people to know that's why he wore the shirts and the, why he got the letters on the truck and why he got the ankle tap because people knowing he was an AGR was a really important thing to him. Uh, and belonging is the aspect of brotherhood that drives that the most. It's the biggest predictor longitudinally of retention, right? So guys who leave after freshman, sophomore, junior year tend to be the ones who feel the lowest degrees of belonging. Chapters that have really high belonging don't have retention issues, right? Because if it's your family, if I feel connected, if I feel valued, if I, if I have these deep, meaningful relationships, then just piecing out after sophomore year since I moved out of the house, that's, that's not a thing that you do because that commitment, that brotherhood is much deeper. It's, it's much more emotional. Um, one of the interesting things that I, I'll share, a, a lot of conversations going on right now in the fraternity world about inclusion, diversity, in historically white fraternities like chi -Fi. The biggest difference on all the things that we measure in our research, and we study like 30 different constructs, right? A lot of different things. And when you compare white fraternity members to non-white members in historically white fraternities like chi -Fi, the biggest difference that we see in terms of members of color and white members in terms of their experience is on the, one of the items on the belonging scale when we measure belonging and, and it's the item, my brothers include me in the things that they are doing. So just think about like your day-to-day -day interactions with your brothers, right? Like, oh, let's go grab some food. Let's, let's go grab some beers. Let's, let's go watch a movie. Let's go, let's just go hang out at somebody's house, right? Just like the normal everyday stuff members of color feel like they are less likely to be included in those things. And that's a really sad commentary, right? And, and, and what we know is that there are some chapters who do this very well, but there are a lot of chapters who don't. And, and, and as you think about brotherhood and its connection to diversity and inclusion, I want you to think about, and if you're a leader of your chapter, having a conversation with your members of color and specifically asking them about this exact issue, do, do you feel included? Do you feel like guys in the chapter include you on the things that we're doing? And, and, and making sure that your members are, are, are going above and beyond to make sure that you're being inclusive, right? Inclusive has kind of become a buzzword, right? We throw it around a lot. What does it really mean? It means including people and, and people feeling like they're included. And that's a big problem. That's the single biggest dividing line between members of color and white members in, in our fraternity chapters. And it's something that we all need to do a better job addressing. So I encourage you as you think about belonging and creating that sense of belonging, thinking specifically about the role that inclusion plays, especially for those members of color uh, in, in creating that sense of belonging. Last aspect of brotherhood is this notion of accountability. Uh, this idea, again, that we push one another to be better people, we hold one another to high standards, and this guy's definition, very straightforward. My brothers make me a better man by holding me to high standards. It means something to be a chi -fi. We have standards, we have values, we have expectations, and we hold one another to those things. And if we see a brother doing something that runs counter to those expectations, we address it. We do something about it. it it's very straightforward, and in many ways, maybe the most altruistic way of thinking about brotherhood, thinking about it through the lens of those shared values, those expectations that we have from one another, and really pushing one another to become the best chi -fis, and as a result, the best people, the best men that, that we can be. That's a, it's a really powerful way of thinking about brotherhood. And when you think about why that's so important, why accountability is so important, it's what really connects us to our ritual more than anything. I, I, was, I was talking with a group one time, a fraternity chapter, and I asked them, I said, you know, why is, why is accountability so important? And this guy said, it, it, it's what brings our values to life. It's what brings our ritual to life. And I was like, man, that's a really profound way to think about it. That, that without accountability, your ritual, those shared values that you talked about, they're just words on paper. You know, we stand up and say them at the beginning of formal chapter meetings, but they don't really mean anything. It's just stuff we say. But when you have accountability, it brings those things to life, right? So now these values aren't just something that we talk about. 
these values are part and parcel of, of who we are and what we do. And, and by doing that, it really brings the ritual. It brings those values to life. I think that's a profoundly uh, powerful way to think about brother, brotherhood and, and, and this notion of accountability. So one of the things that I always hear when I talk to people in fraternities is that they get accused of this notion of you're just buying your friends. And I'm sure most of you on the webinar tonight have been accused of this at some point after you joined a fraternity, one of your non-Greek friends on campus or a friend back home or a family member said, ah, oh, fraternity, you're just buying your friends. And I'm curious, I, I want to stop sharing the screen for a second. I want to, I'm curious how you responded to that. If, if you've ever, as part of being in a fraternity, if you've ever been accused of buying your friends, how did you respond to that? Like, what was your retort? How, how did you come back from from being accused of buying your friends? What did you say? <clears throat> this might be a longer answer. I'll give folks a minute to enter their answer into the chat box. I'm not paying enough. I hear that all the time, man. That's the best friends money could buy. Uh, I would be friends with these people regardless. I'm paying for other experiences and the benefits. Uh, they all paid to be friends with me, Nick. I love it. That's awesome. I've never heard that before. That's really funny. Um, I, I, I want to go back up to uh, uh, Christopher's response. You're paying for the other experiences and benefits. I would argue take that the next step, like, well, what are the experiences and benefits? Let's go back to our original conversation. What's the currency of fraternity? What's our product? Brotherhood. You're not buying friends. You are paying to have this experience called brotherhood. I, I think that's the best answer to the question, right? Like, it's not buying friends. I've got a lot of friends who aren't in my fraternity I'm in a fraternity because I'm paying to have this experience, this full robust experience, all four of these things happening at the same time, that that's what I'm paying for. I'm not buying friends. I'm paying to have this idea of brotherhood. So if, if you buy that and that's true, then that begs a second question. And I want to go back to the chat box for this one. If, if the, if, if, if it's not about buying friends, it's about paying to have this experience called brotherhood, then you've got to help me understand the difference between those two things. What's the difference between friendship and brotherhood? If we're not buying friends, we're paying for an experience. What's the difference between those two things? Let's go back to the chat box for that. What's the difference between friendship and brotherhood? Curious to get your all's answers to that. <clears throat> It's a lifelong commitment. Yeah, it's it, it's a bond that's stronger and deeper. True, but, but you make an assumption that a friendship is by definition only surface surface level. Some of my best friends in the world are not my brothers. And I would say that I have a lifelong commitment to them, right? Like I, I, I've, I've got dear friends that are like family to me that I'm godfather of their children. I will be there for them through thick and thin. So while you definitely have that with your brothers, if you think about it, and certainly when you get to be my age and you have the benefit of hindsight, like you realize that there are friends that I would go out of my way for even more so than some of my brothers, right? Especially now that I'm 20 years removed from, from college. But, but there is definitely that notion of a lifelong commitment, but I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure that that distinguishes the two because I, I have that same passionate commitment for, for some of my friends who are, who are not my brothers. Other, other thoughts or answers to that question? What's the difference between friendship and brotherhood?
crosses boundaries of needing to know someone. So I get to know someone for a while for them to be considered a friend, but the individuals in this chat I know are my brothers without meeting them. Shared unspoken connection. That's cool, right? Based on what, right? That shared unspoken connection is based on some things. It's based on you're having gone through the ritual, your awareness of those values, what it means, the connection. To me, I, and, and I'm going to go back to, to my screen, to me, the answer to this question, walk through the four scheme of brotherhood, right? When I ask this question, I always get the solidarity response, right? Like, oh, you know, you, you got to be there for your brothers. You may not be there for your friends. And again, it's like, I've got friends that I would go to the ends of the earth for, 100%, more so, frankly, than some of the guys I was in, in my fraternity with, that I would, I, would, I would literally lay down for them. Um, sense of camaraderie, the fun, the social side, same thing, right? Like I've got friends that are not in my fraternity, you know, that I love spending time with, hanging out with and, and have a, a, a so much fun anytime we get to spend time together. Belonging, family, again, I've got friends where I, I feel like family, right? Like we spend time together, but, but when you get to that last aspect of brotherhood, accountability, the shared values, the standards, right? It's like, if you've got a friend who's doing something bad, problematic, whatever, right? You might say something to them about it. You might confront them about it, but you're not obligated to. And, and I think that's the difference, right? That obligation that we have to one another to push one another to be better people. That, that if you don't have accountability, if your chapter's not doing accountability, you don't really have brotherhood. You're just a group of friends. You're just a group of dudes hanging out, having a good time. You might be a social club. You might be a gang. You might be one big happy family, but you're not a fraternity, right? Because a fraternity implies that you're a brotherhood. And, and, and to me, accountability is what distinguishes brotherhood from friendship. And I think that's a really powerful way to, to think about why all four of these, but especially accountability, are, are so terribly important. So what I want to do is spend the last few minutes that we've got tonight helping you think through making your own brotherhood better. Uh, we've understood kind of what brotherhood is, why it matters, why some of these aspects of brotherhood are important. What I want to do is spend our last 15 minutes together getting you to think about how you can make your brotherhood better. And I want you to start by thinking about recruitment. You're selling your brotherhood to prospective members. What are you selling? And who are you selling it to? If you're only selling the social side of brotherhood, got a lovely, well-worn beer pong table on the screen here. If you're only selling that aspect of brother, you can tell how old this picture is by the Miller Light cans, by the way. Right? I, I need to find a new beer pong picture. I've been using this one for a long time. And those, those Miller Light cans have been out of circulation for at least six or seven years. If this is the aspect of brotherhood that you're selling, and you're selling it to guys who know they want to be in a fraternity because they want this, they want the social aspect of brotherhood, don't complain to me when you've got guys who show up at the house and it's just the dudes and there's no chicks hanging out there and it's not fun. And it's like, yeah, F this, I'm going to the bar, right? Because that's what you sold. That was the product that you sold and you sold it to people who are interested in that. If you're only selling the fun side of brotherhood to people who know they want to be in fraternities to have fun, you're not going to have a very good fraternity. You're not going to have a very good brotherhood. You're going to have a bunch of dudes who like to party and hang out on weekends. You're not going to have brotherhood. So if you want to have better brotherhood, you got to start by selling a different product to different people, not just selling the fun to those always joiners who know they want to have fun, but selling the more meaningful stuff, selling belonging. This is a family. These are, and, and we're going to treat you like family. We're going to love you like a brother and accountability. We're going to make you a better person. We're going to push you to become a more uh, well-rounded moral person of character. Like they're guys who don't go through fraternity rush and they would never consider joining fraternities because they think that this is all it's about. But if you could convince people 
that no, a fraternity is not just about this. It's about these other things too. It's about belonging and, and, and trust and, and these powerful emotional connections with people who are going to be there for you. And it's about this group of people who are going to push you to become the best possible version of yourself that you can be. There are guys who would be interested in that, who aren't interested in this. But if you only sell the fun to those guys who know they want to be in fraternities, it's a downward spiral. And, and we all know where it ends. It ends up with a bunch of guys who don't give a shit about anything but parties. And it's frankly a chapter that's, that's not going to be around for very much longer. And I'm willing to guess that everyone on this call at some point in the last few years, a chapter on your campus has been closed. And, and it's because they never got this figured out. All they kept selling was the fun to guys who were only interested in fun. And that's a recipe for long-term failure right? You got to rethink who you're selling to and, and the product that you're selling. And in doing so, you got to think about being different. You've got to carve out a niche on your campus. Fraternities don't have the best reputation right now. Incoming students and in particular parents, and our research shows a steep decline in, in the now seven years that we've been doing this research, in fraternity members who say that their parents pay their dues. What does that mean? Sorority members still around two thirds of them say that their parents pay most of their dues for them. For fraternity members, it's down to now less than a third. It's because parents don't support it. They read all the news articles. They see what's going on. They hear about the hazing deaths on TV and they think it's just this. They think it's all this. So if you're going to recruit a different type of fraternity member, and if you're interested in building a different type of fraternity, then you've got to be different. You've got to do different things. You've got to show people that your chapter, Chi Phi at whatever university you're at, isn't like other fraternities. We're actually trying to provide brotherhood, accountability, belonging. This isn't just a place where you party. So we're going to go out and we're going to find those guys who are interested in something better and more meaningful. And if you're on a campus that relies primarily on formal rush early in the fall semester, this is even harder for you, right? Because you're really forced into a situation where you have to go after guys in that big pool of always joiners. Those guys who go through formal rush in the fall semester are the guys who have bought into the stereotype. They're aware of all the bad stuff and they're like, hell yeah, sign me up, this is my thing. So you can't just rely on trying to go through and find those needles in a haystack going through formal rush. You've got to work outside of that process. You got to meet guys in your classes. You got to meet guys in other things that you're involved with on campus. If you want better brotherhood, you got to recruit better brothers. And in order to do that, you've got to figure out how you're going to look different from the majority of the other fraternities on your campus, because the majority of fraternities on your campus are just offering this. They're offering a social experience to people who want to party on the weekends. If you want your brotherhood to be more than that, then you've got to figure out how you're going to carve out your niche on your campus and find those guys who aren't interested in this, but would be interested in something more meaningful. And once you do that, once you start recruiting better brothers who are interested in a different type of brotherhood, you've got to rethink how you're socializing them into your chapter. We can't just make the pledging process all about solidarity. We're going to put you through a shitty experience. You're going to come together as a group. And after eight weeks, we'll initiate you. Hey, high five, you're a brother, right? This is the biggest mistake that chapters make. The single biggest mistake that fraternities make is that they focus on solidarity, thinking that that's gonna bring the pledge class together. And what they assume is that by bringing the pledge class together, that those guys are gonna be more committed. You're gonna be more committed to the chapter. But what we found in our research, and I've already shared with you the answer to this question, solidarity, it does predict commitment a little bit. It's a very weak correlation, but there's a positive and statistically significant correlation. In fact, all four aspects of brotherhood predict commitment to, certain, to a certain degree, but one of the four predicts commitment two to three times better than the other three. One of the aspects of brotherhood is a much better predictor of commitment, and I've already told you which one it is. It's belonging. 
we've got to make our new member processes less about solidarity, less about making it hard, less about earning it, and more about building those really deep, powerful, emotional connections, not only among and between the members of the pledge class, right, but also between pledge classes. And, and, and we've done a lot of research about this with regards to how we create belonging, particularly with new members. And there's a really strong connection between this aspect of, of emotional vulnerability. And I've read about this and I've heard people talking about vulnerability. I'm like, I don't, I don't know that I buy that. What does that mean? But then we started seeing it show up in our own research. And I want you to think about your own experience as a new member. I want you to think about the, the experience that you had as a pledge that you would say after which you felt the deepest sense of emotional connection to the other guys in your pledge class. Was there a particular activity or event or something that you all did? And I, I, don't, I don't need you to answer, but I do want you to think about the answer. When I ask that question, the answer I get most often, 80 to 85% of the time, is someone will tell the story. They'll say, well, you know, we, we had a pledge retreat. We were out in the woods and we built a fire and everyone was just standing around and we started, you know, guys just started going around and, and talking and opening up about what was going on in their lives, the things they were dealing with, the things they were struggling with. We created an environment where people were given permission and encouraged to open up and be emotionally vulnerable and talk about those things that they don't normally open up and share and talk about. And if someone does something like that, if a chapter does an activity like that, everyone will point to that activity and say, that was the most meaningful thing. It builds trust. It builds emotional connection. You're able to relate to people on a much deeper level. You go beyond the surface level. You go beyond the mask and get to know this person for who they really are. And it builds a powerful emotional bond. Here's what we've learned. Most fraternity chapters do something like that at some point but most of them only do it once. The best fraternity chapters maybe do it twice. But, but if you do it, people will immediately point to that as the most powerful thing that we do. But it's like, man, you've said this is the most powerful thing, but you only do this activity one time a year, maybe one time a semester. Think about how much deeper those emotional connections would be. Think about how much stronger that sense of belonging would be if we did that sort of activity, not just once during the pledge ship, but regularly right, throughout the entire new member process. So think about your new member process and how you're utilizing opportunities to move past solidarity towards belonging and understanding the difference between those two. It's not, I have your back because I've been told that I have your back and we've been through some shit together. It's, I have your back because I have a really powerful, deep emotional connection with you because we've really opened up and shared and talked to one another man-to-man, -man, open, no mask, no BS, like I know who you are and I've shared things with you that I've never shared with anyone else or only the people that I'm the closest in the world to know these things about me. And if you can get your new members to that place, that sense of belonging and as a result, that commitment, that, that, that retention, that engagement, all of those things are gonna get better. You gotta make the switch from focusing on solidarity to, to focusing on belonging. Connected to that and connected to hazing, I want to go back to this slide for a second. This idea of earn it becomes a big issue in a lot of chapters, right? You got you to earn it as a pledge. And, and this gets caught up in this notion of social status. And I talked about social status a, a little bit ago, the social status importance, caring where your chapter is in the social hierarchy. And, 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 and what I found in our research is that there's this cycle. And once you make your pledge process all about earning it to protect your social status, then it puts your path, you put your chapter on this path that's a downward spiral, right? And, and here's how it plays out. I want you to think about just an honest assessment of where your chapter is in that social pecking order on your campus. We'll actually do this really quickly in the chat box. Just in one word, I want you to just type in top, middle, or bottom. Is your chapter top tier, middle tier, or bottom tier? I'm just curious to get kind of a feel for the people on the call. Like, would you say your chapter is socially elite, top tier, middle tier, bottom tier? Matthew, thank you for your honesty. We got a bottom.
Anyone think they're top tier? We got any top tier chapters on here tonight? Top depending on the year, depending on what other chapters got closed. We're top tier in our eyes, of course. Yeah. So we're, we're all over the spectrum, right? We got some bottom, we got some top, middle, top, depending on the year. So we're we're kind of we're kind of all over the place. If we make grades or not, that's funny. Um, so here, here's how this cycle plays out. So you know, eventually one day, if you hang around long enough, your fraternity social status will get better, right? So if you're not top tier now, come back in 10, 15 years. And this, this happened to me. I, when I graduated from UT AGR, we were solidly middle tier, 60, 70 guys, good, involved on campus, good reputation, but like not socially elite at all. I come back 15 years later, I'm involved as an advisor. And this was the first sign. I show up at a tailgate, you know, Tennessee versus Florida, big game, big tailgate. And like sorority members from like all the hot sororities on campus who never hung out with us when I was in school, they're all at the house, you know, I'm like, we have 80 pies at our house, you know, like what in the world? Uh, when did that happen? Like high five, you know, we've made it. We had, we, we'd climbed up. Here's what I realized happened. The reason we climbed up is because all the chapters ahead of us in social pecking order, when I was in, 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 the, in the chapter 15, 20 years ago, they'd all been closed and we just kind of slowly worked our way up. So, so here's what happens. Fraternities who become top tier, they become a victim of their own success because what they realize is that one day that the guys who are joining aren't joining them because they feel any connection to the people, to the values, to the organization, to what it's about. It's like, I want to be a Chi-Fi because Chi-Fi is top tier. And I want to exploit all the social benefits uh, associated with being in a top tier fraternity. And so once you make that realization, you say, well, you know, we can't, we can't just let these people have this. We can't let these guys just join us and exploit our social privileges with, without, without earning it, right? So we begin hazing. And, and, and this earn it mindset is what starts permeating our new member process. So we're top tier, can't give it away. We got to make guys earn it. And so thinking that by making it harder, by making guys earn it, that they're going to be more committed at the end, that they'll be good brothers. But what these chapters learn is that it has, in fact, the opposite effect. When you make pledgeship all about earning it, your members don't become more committed. They become less committed. They feel they become entitled. It's like, well, I earned it as a pledge, and now I can do whatever the hell I want. I don't have to show up for things. I don't have to clean the house. Make the pledges clean the house. I don't have to, you know, help build a homecoming float. Make the pledges do that. Like it's like I earned it during pledgeship, and now I've earned this thing that you can never take away from me. And now I can just do whatever I want. And so these chapters look around and they're like, oh my god, we've got all these lazy, terrible, entitled members. We must not be hazing them hard enough, wrong, but that's what they think. So the hazing gets worse, and then eventually it gets so bad that the chapter gets closed for hazing, and then the cycle plays out again. Think about those chapters on your campus who've gotten closed in the last couple of years for hazing. Almost 90% of the time, they were probably top tier, quote unquote, socially elite in that social top tier. So when they leave, creates a vacuum. You take a top tier group out. And then that group that's right on the cusp, maybe that's you, maybe you're top of the middle tier just waiting to break through. So that top tier group gets closed and boom, there you are, you've made it. We're top tier. But then are you going to become a victim of this cycle? Are you going to become a victim of your own success? Here's the mistake that chapters make is that they say, we're going to weed these people out who want to exploit our social benefits. We're going to weed them out during the pledging process. But if you're top tier, you can't do it because they'll do whatever. If you're top tier, your pledges will go along with whatever you want them to do because in their mind, it's like, well, it's worth it, right? I'm going to get to be in this top tier group. The reason bottom tier fraternities don't haze as much as top tier fraternities is because they can't, because their pledges won't tolerate it. The guys are going to be like, what the fuck is this? I'm not doing this, right? This is stupid. It's not worth it. But if you're top tier, you're like, well, this sucks. This is awful. But at the end of this, I'm going to get to be a Chi Phi for the next three and a half years, and that's going to be awesome. So you can't weed those guys out during pledgeship. They'll go along with whatever. You have to weed them out before. You have to weed them out during recruitment. You got to ask better questions to get to know guys and their motivation for wanting to be there. And, and those guys who are only interested in being a Chi-Fi because they want to exploit the social benefits associated with being a Chi-Fi, they got to go. Those are not going to be good members. Those are going to be members that just cause you problems. We got to get better at weeding these guys out during recruitment and not waiting until the new member process to try and weed them out. I'll close with, with this last piece. 
and we've researched this a lot. We've studied chapters with really good brotherhood and chapters that struggle with brotherhood. And, and we're very interested in, in accountability, right? Chapters with really strong accountability and what distinguished them from chapters who struggled with accountability. And, and when you think about accountability, you got to think of two systems at play. You have your formal systems and your informal systems. And I've kind of graphically depicted them here. So I'll set a scenario, I'll give you an example. You got a brother who's really struggling with substance use to the point that it's becoming problematic, it's impacting him, his behavior, his health, his well being, his performance in classes, et cetera. So there's two different ways you could handle that. You could handle it through your formal system your judicial boards, your standards board, whatever that is. And like, hey, you're doing drugs in the house. You got a lot of issues. So we're going to put you on social probation. You got to do all these things. And, and, and we're going to deal with it through the formal process. Or informally, the four or five people who he's the closest to in the chapter sit down with him and they say, hey, man, we're, we're worried about you. We're concerned about you. What's going on? And, and it's just kind of this informal conversation. In that situation... Which do you think would be more impactful, the formal or the informal? And I'm not even going to go back to the chat box because I know everyone is saying to themselves, informal, because it's obvious, right? Informal is better. It's more personal. It's coming from a place of love and concern. And here's what we found. Chapters with really strong systems, with really high accountability when we measure it, when we measure their brotherhood, their formal processes are unremarkable. In fact, the only thing that's remarkable about them is how infrequently they use them. All the chapters with really strong brotherhood have really strong, well-developed informal systems of accountability. They would much rather and are more comfortable dealing with something informally than of handling it to handing it to the to the standards board. And when you ask them why, and this is really important, this gets to the connection between the various aspects of brotherhood. When you ask these chapters that are really good at informal accountability, why that comes so naturally to them, do you know what they say? They connect it back to belonging. If I've got deep, meaningful relationships with the guys in my pledge class and I see one of them struggling, it's easy for me to sit down and have that difficult conversation with him. Whereas if I don't know him that well, if we've never really connected in a deep and meaningful way, but I'm worried and I'm, I'm struggling, I can see that he's struggling. It's like, well, let standards deal with that, right? I'm not comfortable. I don't have the, the relationship with him to sit down and have that difficult conversation. Informal accountability, way more powerful than formal, and it derives from creating that sense of belonging. If you've got deep, meaningful relationships in your chapter, it's going to make it easier for those informal systems of accountability to thrive. One of the chapters we studied, it's the last anecdote I'll share, they had even gone so far, and this chapter's accountability brotherhood was through the roof, they had gone so far as to informalize their formal process. Here's what they did. They still had a standards committee and they would meet regularly. So, you know, hey, you know, this person, their behavior is problematic in whatever way. So what the standards committee would do is they, they wouldn't call that person in. They would get together and they'd say, okay, who, who would be the best person or people in the chapter to go talk to this guy? So maybe it's his big brother. Maybe it's these two or three guys in his pledge class, like whoever it is. And then they would call those people in. And it's like, hey, we got, you know, we got issues with this member. We want you to go talk to him. So instead of that member being called into the standards board or exec board or whatever, it was the people in the chapter who that member was the closest to just going and talking to him. Like, hey, what's the deal? What's going on? And then those members would come report back to the standards board. Like, here's how the conversation went. Accountability was through the roof in that chapter. It was amazing. And no one had told them to do that. They just kind of come up with it on their own and saw that it worked much better. If you want to boost accountability, you need to have a formal process. You need to use it when you have to, but you're really going to see more value in terms of your accountability by strengthening the informal process. And it's going to be much easier when you work on building that sense of belonging. I'm going to leave my, my contact information here on the screen for a second. Uh, take a picture of it there. If, if you want to follow up on any of this, shoot me an email. Happy to, to be a resource for you guys on anything connected to this. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now. And if folks do have any questions, uh, absolutely happy to entertain them at this point. Uh, we'll hang out for just another minute. But as people are here, just a couple of quick announcements. Again, thank you, Gentry, for spending some time with us this evening thank you. Uh, for Kai-Fi. Uh, our webinar for next week, I'll have some information going about, out about that soon, but that'll be on 
sexual assault prevention with our partners at RAIN. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Um, but that's all we have. Thanks so much everyone for attending. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I can connect you with Gentry um, or connect with him on your own as well. Um, and we appreciate everyone uh, being with us tonight. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everyone.